that that was a question he wanted to ask me. Why were you uh, getting dressed in the dark? There was no lights on uh, in the house, and I want to show you something to, uh, to answer that. Now, we have so much ground to cover here, and it would be simply impossible to cover it all in this period of time. Uh, there's so many things that I want to talk about. I'm going to take a little opportunity right now uh, to attempt to cover some things that are very important to me. Uh, I realize that during the interview portion of this case, uh, we're going to have a, an awful lot of criticism that uh, Ross Becker didn't cover some areas. But I'll tell you, uh, in that period of time, there's days worth of uh, of uh, questions in this case that I would like to address, and I'm sure in the not too distant future I will be addressing those things. And I don't care who did this interview, it would have been virtually impossible to cover all of the issues. But as I say, there are some uh, things that are very close to me that I would like to attempt to cover in this uh, next half hour or so. As I mentioned earlier, uh, when we were upstairs, uh, uh, there's something about this room and the lighting in this room that I'd like to go into right now. Uh, it seemed to be very important to uh, uh, Brokaw and, and Marsha Clark seemed to um, do her normal thing, uh, refer to it uh, erroneously or inaccurately, I should say, throughout this trial, and that's the lighting that was here that night. I believe uh, Alan Park said words to the effect that um, uh, he didn't see or he couldn't detect any lighting in the house, not that there was no lights on, which probably would have been the uh, correct way to state it because from that front gate, uh, either one of my two gates, uh, it would have been virtually impossible. It is impossible, and we're showing you that now this is a view that he would have had uh, of my house, but it's impossible to tell if any lights are on in my bedroom. As a matter of fact, I think I can turn on 90% of the lights on in my house, in my living room, uh, in my dining room, in my family room, my pool room, my bathroom, my bedroom, and uh, from the street, uh, you would not uh, notice that. From the street, what you can see is my daughter's room upstairs, Sydney Brooks. You can see my office and the kitchen. I, uh, it bothered me when I was in uh, court. I would go back to my cell and Marsha would say time and time again, there was no lights on in the house and when that shadowy figure had entered the house, lights went on all over the house and I was saying, boy, how can she say that? That's not true. You can't tell when lights come on all over my house. The only rooms you can see is the kitchen and since I wasn't packing a picnic, picnic to go to Chicago on, I didn't go in the kitchen and turn on any lights. I didn't go into my office, which, uh, which is the lower left room in my house uh, looking at it. Uh, so those lights didn't come on and upstairs there was no reason to go into Sydney Brooks room because she was in Bun on Bundy. But I knew that the lamps were on in my house and as you can see you can put the lamps on in my entry, you can put the lamp on in my kitchen, you can put on all the other lights on in my house and there is just no way for someone who's at either one of those gates to one see it, detect it, or testify that no lights were on. So, uh, Tom Brokaw, I hope that answers your question. I was not getting dressed in the dark. Park did say he thought he saw some light upstairs. Uh, he didn't know what it was, and I believe there was probably lights coming out of my, uh, out of my bedroom to the front of the house. So, uh, Marsha, you can stop saying there was no lights on in my house. It was completely dark, and possibly, even though I know that the entry lamp was on, uh, possibly I may have hit my foyer, uh, it's not really a chandelier, it's an antique piece there and maybe that threw some more light on over the upstairs window or the closet that's next to my front door. Uh, I, I really can't say, but uh, enough of the lights. Uh, let's talk about opportunity. Uh, Marsha Clark and, and the, the prosecution team sort of went out of their way to establish uh, that I had plenty of opportunity. I'll tell you, there certainly would have been uh, many more opportune times if, uh, if I was uh, bent uh, to commit a crime, which I didn't, uh, such as this, uh, uh, I certainly wouldn't have picked this time to, to do it. Uh, I think it was very important for them to uh, make this crime take place at 10.15. Uh, they went out of their way to establish that with a barking dog, a welling dog, I guess was the word, and they avoided some witnesses, some key witnesses, people who walked by the scene, uh, people who were walking their dog, Heister, the young couple on their first date, uh, people coming out of dinner parties, uh, uh, that night. Uh, they went out of their way to avoid calling those witnesses and when these witnesses came forward they went out of their way to attempt to discredit these witness, witnesses, to accuse them of trying to interject themselves in this case to, to make money which I found uh, uh, sort of ironic. Uh, none of these people, including witnesses that were on the airplane, 
uh, uh, who copyrighted his notes. None of these people have gone out to try to make a dime on this case, but who went out and pimped it immediately? Marsha Clark, uh, Darden. These guys went out immediately and made millions of dollars. Now, I don't begrudge them that. I truly do not begrudge uh, the defense team and the prosecution team for making money, but I think it's somewhat hypocritical of these people to try to cast aspersions on all of these other people, accuse them of trying to do it when they had their agents and they immediately took advantage of the celebrity that they received during this trial. Also during that opportunity, let me throw in this. The whole neighborhood knows my white Bronco. Knew it then. I'd spend much of the spring at Nicole's Bundy's house, more there than I did at my house. Everyone knew that car. That'd be the last car that I would drive uh, secretly uh, if I was going to attempt to commit a crime and Johnny did something during this cr uh, case when he put a knit hat on his head, I submit to you that I could be two, three blocks away with a knit hat on my head and people would be saying, hey, there's OJ. See him down there with the knit hat on his head. It's, uh, I don't know, I thought it was uh, ridiculous. Let's talk about the media a little bit and this is sort of a pet peeve uh, of mine. I, I just, I mean, I was being barbecued from, from day one on the media, and I, I had always understood the media is supposed to be uh, reporting the facts, you know, without interpretation. Well, that certainly didn't happen in this case. Uh, every place you look, there was an interpretations. Everybody was putting their spin on it time and time again from the very beginning. Now, you expect some things. You take with a grain of salt, for the most part, stories you'll see in the tabloids, uh, the National Enquirer, the Star, uh, the Globe, and those tabloid uh, publications. But I can tell you flat out, time and time again in this case, and this is something you're going to hear a little more about because uh, that will be my next uh, litigation, uh, um, um, my, my battle <laughs> or my fight to get justice from the, these publications because they didn't shade the truth. They didn't interpret, uh, and, and interpret evidence. They flat out lied time and time again. They made up stories. Once they made up stories, some of the uh, uh, video uh, tabloid uh, shows, some under the guise of legitimate uh, interview shows, they ran with those stories. Uh, they brought in uh, psychiatrists and analysts to analyze why O.J. did various things during the trial and since the trial, things that I didn't come close to doing. Uh, uh, just recently, there was a big story uh, about me attempting suicide in the National Enquirer. That's a flat-out lie. I will put everything that I own. You can come in here, National Enquirer, and interview me daily. You can take everything I own. If you can show me anything in that story that's true, any doctor who's ever entered this house to, to help me, my daughter, you bring my kids into it, my son on Thanksgiving that I went to his house and wasn't welcome, that's totally false. His mother, Marguerite, her husband, Anthony, myself and my daughter and a couple of my daughter's girlfriends, we spent Thanksgiving together and later on when some of the other younger kids came, we didn't watch any football, uh, we left, the mother and I. Marguerite and I left, but never have I attempted suicide in any way, shape, or form. I saw stories where uh, Neiman Marcus, Neiman Marcus uh, uh, denied me the right to shop after I was one. I never called Neiman Marcus to do that. Two, the manager of Neiman Marcus called me to apologize for the story, to say it wasn't true, and to say I was more than welcome to come in there. I guess what bothers you, you can see a Jay Leno make jokes. It was painful to me, but I didn't think there was any real malice in the jokes that he was making. You see a Howard Stern, a guy that, hey, he's irreverent about everything. And even though I didn't like it, I thought some of it was, uh, was vicious, that's Howard Stern. So to an extent, you understand it. It's the legitimate press, people under the guise of journalism, people like Newsweek magazine and Time magazine. I mean, what was that all about? Time Magazine, as if this crime wasn't bad enough, they darkened my picture. They put my picture on the cover. What was the purpose of that? The darker you are, is that the more sinister and evil that you might be? I mean, it's, 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 it's embarrassing almost. This is Time Magazine. Newsweek is a magazine that I subscribe to, and time and time again, I'll talk a little about that in a second, they, uh, they just wrote stories. I think one of the most racist stories uh, that I had ever read under the guise of journalism they wrote in August of 94. In that story, they accused me of going to the University of Southern California, a white school. They implied because I wanted to be white. 
the University of Southern California with one of the most storied sports histories of any school in the country. The first All-American in the early 20th century at USC was Bryce Taylor, a black man. So many great athletes, white, black minorities, have gone in and out of that university. And I went there because I thought it was the best university that I can go for, for an education and for the athletic tradition there. They accused me in this article for taking diction lessons because I want to sound white. Now, many of you out there wrote me in my early days in television, especially on Monday Night Football, told me you were fans of mine, but you wish I would work on my diction. Like most actors, like most people who work in television, in the movies, uh, I took that to heart and I hired a diction co coach so I wouldn't embarrass you or myself or my family by my diction. I, there's a lot of ghetto in the way that I talk, but they accused me of trying to be white. Sir Lawrence Olivier, to the day he died, every morning started off with his voice coach, and I don't think there's any black person working in television, a white person who's serious about that craft that doesn't work on their diction and their voice, but they said it because I wanted to be white or act more white or sound more white. Uh, in there, there was some pictures, one with a group of women at a charity affair, I think they were with Hawaiian Tropic, and they implied that I was looking for sleazy sleazy women looking for stuff. A couple of those women called Larry King and said that they approached me for the picture and I didn't uh, attempt to date them or hit on them in any way, shape, or fortune. Not that I'm a, not above that. Uh, and probably the thing that was most embarrassing to me, they cropped a picture of me with what we call a comedy stripper in front of me. A stripper. Let me tell you about that night. That happened in my backyard. We were celebrating mine and Al Cowling's 40th birthday, Nicole and my 10th year together, Denise Brown's 30th birthday, Joe Stellini's 50th birthday, Arnell Simpson and Tanya Brown, Nicole's sister's graduation from high school. We had 400 of our friends and family there. We were on the stage, Nicole thought it was funny and sent this comic stripper. My, my family was there, her family was there, all our friends was there. And what did they do? They cropped this picture to try to imply that here I am hanging in some sleazy area with strippers, you know, and all our family was there and they knew exactly what they were doing 